biodiversity and biomes. We are going to see how the variety of life varies from location to location uh, depending on several factors. And so let's begin and let's talk about what biodiversity is. Biodiversity we are going to define as the number and variety of species living together in a particular ecosystem. Now biodiversity is much greater in terrestrial or land environments than in marine. Of all of this known species today, 86% of them live in um, terrestrial biomes where only 14% live in the oceans. Now, Biodiversity is going to depend on a lot of different factors. Climate is going to be the important one. We're going to see that the location of biomes is controlled by climate. Temperature, precipitation, humidity, cloud cover, all of those things. But we're also going to see biodiversity will depend on um, what natural resources are available. What kind of predators do we have to deal with? All of those things are going to affect biodiversity. Now, if we look at this, this is a global map of biodiversity of vascular plants. Remember, we talked about vascular plants in our last topic, Life Through Time. So the red, the deep red, is where we see the highest biodiversity. That would be over 5,000 species living within that particular area. And if we take a look at this map, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll recognize a pattern that where do we see the reds and the purples? We see them straddling the equator. Typically, equatorial areas have the highest biodiversity. Most organisms like it hot and wet, which is what we're going to find in equatorial areas. And as you go towards the poles, what happens to the biodiversity? It decreases. And so even though this is just for vascular plants, we tend to see, we tend to see the same picture for other organisms as well. High around the equator and decreasing as you go towards the poles. Now why should we care about biodiversity? In order to have a healthy functioning ecosystem we need a biodiverse community. Now let's just take a look at some of the advantages that biodiversity gives us and this is by no means an exhaustive list. Uh, think about soil formation, guys. Think about our decomposers. Bacteria, worms, snails, slugs, they all take that dead organic material, they break it down, they return it to the soil, which helps in keeping a healthy soil for other vegetation. Waste disposal. Nutrient cycling. Plants uh, have a great role in the transport and transformation of elements, remember we called those biogeochemical cycles. Water and air purification, food supply, even drugs and biotechnology. You'd be surprised at how many plant or animal extracts go into simple thing like aspirin all the way up to some of the latest cancer drugs. And then fuel. Uh, I know we haven't talked about biofuels yet. We'll get there when we talk about energy but we can actually convert plant material into gasoline-like substitutes. And we'll talk more about this uh, later. So a healthy, thriving ecosystem not only benefits the plants and animals that live in there, but also have benefits for humans as well. Now let's look at the other side of the coin. What are some of the major threats to biodiversity? And it should come as no surprise to anyone that the greatest threat is us, is humans. Uh, and here are some of the things that we do. Uh, the greatest threat is habitat destruction. Uh, think about it, guys. We, we plow down a forest to either build a new city, build an agricultural field, and the natural species, the native species that were living there, are displaced. And as Darwin would say, you have a choice. They can either migrate somewhere, el somewhere else or they can go extinct. Well, a lot of this habitat destruction is causing extinction events that we'll talk about here in a couple minutes. Uh, pollution. Uh, we haven't talked a great deal about this, but we'll get to this when we get to environmental health, guys, in our next series of topics. But we create a lot of artificial substances from pesticides uh, to hydrocarbons to synthetic chemicals 
that are often very toxic to biological organisms and if they're released into the environment that can ha cause negative effects. Uh, the last one here, over harvesting. This is simply taking more than nature can um, produce or reproduce. Um, I generally, when I think of this, uh, I like to think of a Vegas buffet on a Friday night. And generally, they were known for seafood. Generally, people that would go, I mean, think about it. If you're going to pay 50 bucks for a buffet, what are you thinking? I'm going to eat all the crab legs I can. Or I'm going to eat all the, the shrimp I can. Well, this is over-harvesting, guys. We tend to take more from nature than nature can replace through reproduction. And so this is this over-harvesting. And what we're seeing today is a lot of species of fish, including tuna, wild tuna, and uh, salmon, uh, salmon and halibut, they're on the brink of extinction because we've literally eaten them into extinction. Uh, there's another part of this over-harvesting, which is poaching. Poaching is the illegal killing of protected animals. So if you remember uh, the introductory, uh, introductory material we talked about, one of the important environmental laws was the Endangered Species Act. If a species is on the brink of extinction, we put them on this list and they have federal protection. Well, the problem is, there's unfortunately, there's a black market for things like uh, elephant tusks, uh, tiger pelts, um, rhino horns. And unfortunately, even though they're protected, people will still kill them because there's money to be made. Um, remember when we talked about economics, guys? Really what it comes down to is money. So even if there's not a above board market, black markets can compel people to do illegal activities. Now here's this habitat destruction. Uh, you can actually see in this picture here, these are actually di some of the different biomes or ecosystems we're going to talk about. And this is how much of their area has been lost. So if we just look at this first one, Mediterranean forests, we've converted almost 70% of that once natural ecosystem. We've cut them down and we've converted it for human habitation. Uh, what we're seeing, this bottom picture here is a picture of the Brazilian rainforest. And every year, the light areas, which are areas that have been clear cut, get bigger than the dark green areas, which are areas where we have vegetation. Uh, and so if you just look at the pure numbers, by 2050, so within the next 30 years, we will have converted uh, somewhere between 40 and 80 percent of all the natural biomes for once again our use. Here's this pollution uh, category and you can see whether it's air pollution or water pollution. This bottom picture here is a farmer pouring pesticides into a sprayer that he will eventually spray on his agricultural fields. And if you take a look at how he's dressed he has a respirator and Tyvek suit. That tells you that you really don't want to get that material on yourself. Uh, here's this poaching. Um, and once again, this is all driven by the black market, whether we're talking about um, tiger pelts, um, tusks from elephants, or black rhino horns. Uh, unfortunately, people want those things. And even though these animals are endangered, uh, they will still risk jail um, in order to supply the demand. We also have another threat uh, to biodiversity called invasive species. This is the introduction of a brand new animal into a brand new habitat. Now here's the problem with this. It upsets that natural balance. There's a natural balance with the native species in their ecosystem. So you introduce a new plant or a new animal and it upsets the balance. Now, here's what happens. The invasive species, they tend to thrive because they don't have to deal with their natural predators anymore and they have access to new natural resources. So their numbers explode. But at the same time, the native species are usually outcompeted out by these invasive species and their numbers decline. So the invasive species numbers go up, but at the same time, the native species, they will suffer from this 
introduction. Uh, you can actually see along the bottom some of the most problematic from kudzu in the southern U.S. to uh, the Asian carp in the Mississippi River has become a plague uh, over the last decade or so. And then zebra mussels. We actually have problems with zebra mussels here in Nevada, in Utah, even into California. This is why if you ever go bo boating, they say to check your boat because they don't want you transporting the zebra mussels from one lake into another. Now, if we talk about it, once again, we mentioned extinction. Okay, Due to human activities, what we're seeing is an uptick in extinction events. And what you see there is the blue line is the exponential growth of humans. I know we haven't talked about that yet. We'll get to human populations next. And then the orange line is the extinction rate. And notice how they seem to follow one another. As we have exponentially grown, the extinction rate has exponentially grown. Now, can we say this with 100% certainty that we're the cause of this? No, we can't say anything with 100% certainty. But is there a link? Is there a correlation between the two? There seems to be. Now, if we take a look at some of the numbers, the what is known as the background extinction rate, this is the normal extinction rate without human interference is about one species every four years. Okay. Once again, guys, we're not the only thing causing extinction. Remember, your environment changes. You either adapt or you go extinct. Now, what we're seeing today is we lose about 30,000 species every year. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them caused by human activities. If you do the math on that, guys, that's a loss of about 82 species every day. So we have gone from losing one species every four years without human interference to now losing 82 species a day. Okay, That kind of uptick, that exponential growth is not normal for most natural systems, guys. That's being influenced by us. Now you can see some of the biggest um, causes of species extinction from changes in land and sea use. That would be, um, for instance, we cut down a forest and we create an agricultural field. Uh, over exploitation and over harvesting, we just talked about that. Climate change is another big one. Um, pollution and then invasive species. If you take a look at it by group, what we notice, guys, is amphibians are the most threatened group uh, as far as extinction rate goes, followed fairly closely by conifers, those are evergreen trees, uh, coral reefs, uh, if you've heard of coral bleaching, we'll talk more about that linked to climate change, global warming, marine mammals, sharks and rays, uh, crustaceans, mammals, and then even birds. But by far the biggest threat is to amphibians. Now, here is our loss of biodiversity, and what these different colors are over here is something that we're going to spend the rest of our topic talking about, something called biomes. These are just different environments. And what you see here, this first chart, this is the potential. So we should be at 100% biodiversity. And what these others are, are through time, 1700, 1800, 1900, 2000 and then a projection to 2050 of the loss of biodiversity. So you'll notice we start with a potential of 100 and we've seen that slowly decline so that we're projecting that the original 100% biodiversity is going to be down to 60% by 2050, which means we will have lost 40% biodiversity mainly through human activity. Now, before we get to talking about the different biomes, I want to introduce something that I call biological organization levels. And we're going to start with something that we've already discussed in this class, species. Remember, species are a group of individuals that can interbreed and remember the important part and produce fertile offspring. Now, if we take a step up 
Our next level of biological organization is the population. We've actually discussed this as well. A population is a group of individuals that belong to one single species living together in a particular area. So we might talk about the population of desert tortoises that live in Clark County, Nevada. If we take another step up, we get to something called a community. A community are several different populations living together in, once again, a same area. So we might talk about here in the valley, in Clark County, Nevada, Nevada pop, uh, the community of uh, desert tortoises and black widows and humans and cacti, all of those different populations together are a community. Now notice each of the first three levels have all been dealing with the biotic portion of the ecosystem. Remember that's the living portion. We take our next step up and we get to something that we've also talked about in this class already, an ecosystem. Remember, an ecosystem includes all the living organisms in a community, the biotic portion, and all the non-living ingredients, the abiotic portion. So once we get to an ecosystem, we're not just dealing with life. We're talking about everything. Rocks, soil, climate, everything. Now we take our final step up, and we get to what we are going to spend the rest of today's topic talking about, a biome. And what a biome is, is a large ecosystem. So we are going to talk about the different biomes that are found across the globe. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to break them into three categories, ladies and gentlemen. We're first going to talk about terrestrial biomes. These are biomes that are found on land. And we're going to talk about the three forest biomes, temperate deciduous forests, boreal forests, and tropical rainforests. While they're all forests, each is unique and different in the types of vegetation and animals that we're going to find there. We're then going to go to um, prairies or grasslands. For those fans of, of bad 70s TV drama, you'll probably remember Little House on the Prairie. Um, we're then going to go tundra. We're going to go to our polar areas. We're then talk about deserts, savanna, and we'll finish up with wetlands. Those will, are, are all grouped as terrestrial biomes. We're then going to move to what are called coastal biomes. These are areas that have both terrestrial processes and marine processes affecting them. And we're going to talk about both waves and tides and talk about what those processes are. And then we'll get into three biomes, the intertidal zone, chaparral, and estuaries. Lastly, we'll end with our marine biomes, those biomes that are found in the ocean. And the good news is it's fairly simple. You have shallow marine biomes found close to continental land masses, and you have deep marine biomes, those biomes that are found in the deeper uh, parts of the ocean basins. And so this is how we're going to divide our discussion, terrestrial, then coastal, then marine. Now before we, we jump in, here is Earth's biomes. And you'll see each of the different colors represents a different biome. Now, if you were to look at this and take a guess at what you think the major controlling factor of where biomes are located, I hope you will come up with climate. Climate is the main driving factor. So I know we haven't discussed climate yet. We'll get there when we talk about climate change. But climate involves everything from how much precipitation you get to temperature to um, humidity, how much moisture is in the air, to cloud cover, winds, all of these things are rolled up in climate. And so that's the major driving factor. Now let's start with our first biome. 
You'll notice in each of the biomes we're going to talk about, guys, I'm going to give you a global picture of where they're located. So notice here that our temperate deciduous forests are located in the eastern half of the U.S., um, parts of western and, um, I guess, northern Europe, and even parts of China, all the way over here, and a small portion down here in Australia. Now, a temperate deciduous forest, these are found in the middle latitudes of the world. When we say that, what we mean is they're found between 30 and 60 degrees both north and south of the equator. Remember in each hemisphere, guys, you have the equator which is 0 degrees and you have the poles which are 90 degrees. So middle latitudes are smack in the middle, 30 to 60 degrees. These are areas that have four distinct seasons. You have a fairly cold winter that goes into a mild spring, hot summer, and a cooler fall. So four seasons, three months approximately for each season. Now, the namesake of this biome are deciduous trees or broadleaf trees. These are trees whose leaves will change color during the fall. Notice that picture in the lower right there. That's the Appalachian Mountains in October. So they, the leaves change color during the fall and then the trees shed their leaves during the winter months. They then grow them back in our spring months. Now, a uh, species of trees would include oak, probably the most common, beech, maple, chestnut, hickory, walnut, and elm. As far as animals that we would find here, deers, maybe even some species of bears, uh, squirrels, rabbits, foxes, uh, all would be fairly common here. We move on to our boreal forest, also called taiga. Notice now we move north. These are located in Canada into Alaska and in northern parts of the Eurasian and in the Europe, uh, European continent. So we're going to see, as far as climate goes, these are going to be areas that are going to be colder and drier. And so instead of deciduous trees, we're going to have conifer or evergreen trees. These are trees that instead of leaves have long, thin, waxy needles. Now that wax is a huge evolutionary advantage, guys. It keeps the cold out and keeps the moisture in. So that wax, huge advantage in these colder climates. Now these are uh, biomes that are located just below our tundra regions. We're going to see in a little bit, guys that up here are our arctic tundra regions, our northern tundra regions. So instead of uh, four seasons, we really only see two seasons here. We're going to get six months of a very harsh and cold winter, followed by six months of a fairly mild summer. It's not going to get that hot, um, but much more milder than the winter. As far as animals, wolves, um, bears, uh, Kodiak, grizzly bears, uh, hawks, eagles, um, you're also going to see caribou, other deer in this region as well, um, fairly common. Our last forest biome are our tropical rainforests. Now once again if you take a look at that, that location picture there, these are areas hugging the uh, equatorial areas. So these are going to be areas with high temperature and high moisture. Hot and wet. That's what we talk about when we talk about equatorial areas. Now just to give you an idea of how wet, rainfall in this biome is usually anywhere between 150 to 300 inches per year. If you compare that with a normal year in Vegas, we get about 8. And actually since 2000, we actually have been getting about 4, 4.5 inches a year. So... 300 versus four and a half. Huge difference. Now, this is the highest biodiversity biome anywhere on Earth, ladies and gentlemen. 
half of all known animal and plant species live in this particular biome. And generally, whenever you hear of a new species being discovered, this is generally where they're discovered. Now, if we look at vegetation, um, we get our canopy trees, our celeba, um, I think that's how you pronounce that, rubber, banana, palm teak, mahogany would all be common vegetation. As far as animals, how much time do you have, guys? Uh, monkeys, jaguars, a whole host of reptiles, frogs, lizards, snakes, all fairly common in this biome. Next, we have our grasslands, our prairies. Now, these are found in the middle latitudes. Remember, that's 30 to 60 degrees north and south of the equator. And they're also found in the interiors of continents. So, notice that map there. They're smack dab in the middles. Prairies are characterized by rolling hills with grasses, flowering plants, and herbs. Take a look at that bottom picture there on the right you'll notice something that's missing there, guys. What's missing? Trees. Generally what we see is this biome doesn't have enough precipitation. You get periodic fires from lightning strikes and thin underdeveloped soil prevent trees from growing in this biome. So your main vegetation is grasses and flowering plants. Now, we see three different types of grasslands depending on uh, precipitation. We have our tall grass prairies. This is where tall grass species are going to dominate. These are in much humid environments where you get higher precipitation levels. Short grass prairies, these are dominated by our shorter grass species. These live in much drier environments. And then you have mixed grass, which is kind of a mixture between the two. So you'll have some short grass species and some tall grass species and so it's not as wet as a tall grass but it's not as dry as a short grass it's somewhere in between now if you take a look at it the US is probably the one um, country that was best known for its prairies back in the day and you'll notice something here guys if you take a look at the prairies that used to cover Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, even in parts into Nebraska, Kansas, and Dakota, these were our tall grass prairies. Those states get moderate to high precipitation. If you move into the plain states, Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, the western portions, we see our mixed grass. So precipitation is lower, and so we'll get this kind of mixture between the two. And then the short grass prairies are found here in the West. Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, even into Arizona. These are the short grass prairies, the drier environments where we're not going to get that much moisture. Now, probably the one animal that is best known for prairies, and don't say prairie dogs, ladies and gentlemen, is the American bison. The American bison used to cover all of the prairies across uh, North America. Uh, they actually were put on the Endangered Species Act back in the 70s. I am happy to say today that their numbers have come back because of actions taken from that Endangered Species Act. Uh, other animals you would find here, you do find prairie dogs, yes. Uh, rabbits, squirrels, um... You'd even find deer, wild horses, mustangs be fairly common in this biome as well. Now let's go to our colder regions, our tundra biomes. Now these are going to be found in colder areas. These are going to be cold and dry biomes, generally experiencing less than 10 inches of precipitation a year. Now once again, cold and the dry no trees. Look at those pictures on the left hand side and what do you see? Grasses, some shrubs, some flowering plants, but no trees. It's just too cold and it's too dry. Now we actually have three different types depending on location. Arctic tundra is found in the northern hemisphere. Antarctic tundra is found in the southern hemisphere 
an alpine tundra is going to be found at the very, very tops of some of our tallest mountain chains. Now, let's start in the north. So our Arctic tundra, once again, if we take a look at our map here, guys, very, very northern reaches of Canada uh, into Alaska, Greenland, and the very, very northern extents of the Eurasian continent. So we're talking about latitudes 55 to 70 degrees north. Not north and south, just north. This is just located in the northern hemisphere. Now, in addition to it being cold and dry, it's also fairly windy. You can get sustained winds of anywhere between 30 and 60 miles per hour. So it's cold, it's dry, and it's windy. Okay. If we were to say take a look at biodiversity, we would see a fairly low biodiversity in this biome. Now it is so cold that uh, a layer of permanently frozen soil exists called permafrost. We'll talk more about permafrost here in a minute. Now once again you're gonna see grasses, you're gonna see shrubs, you're gonna see flowering plants that have adapted themselves to this cold and dry climate. That's the vegetation. As far as common uh, mammals, reindeer, must, uh, musk ox, arctic hare, arctic fox, and then in coastal areas generally where we see um, icebergs you're going to get polar bears. So those are going to be some of your common animals. And if you take a look at all of those animals they have one they have a couple things in common. They either have a thick for a coat or a layer of blubber, layer of fat, or a combination of both that helps them deal with the cold climate. Now let's talk a little bit about permafrost. What is it? It is soil that is either at or below the freezing point of water for at least two years. So to even be considered permafrost, you have to be permanently frozen for two years. Now, if the entire soil was saturated, we wouldn't see any vegetation, ladies and gentlemen. So what we see here is, if you take a look at this top picture, this blue layer, that's the permafrost. That's the soil that's permanently frozen. That permafrost sits on top of usually bedrock. This would be our solid rock down here. Now, this upper layer is the most important layer. This is called the active layer. It actually can freeze during the cold winter months, but thaws during the warmer, milder summer months. If we didn't have that active layer, guys, that freezes and thaws, we wouldn't be able to support grasses or flowering plants. We need that active layer for root growth. Now, what we're seeing is the amount of permafrost has actually been decreasing through time because of global warming, especially in the northern hemisphere. This bottom picture here is a picture, here's the North Pole here, guys. What we're seeing here is the areas in red, these are areas that have permafrost today, but we think the permafrost will be gone by 2050. The areas in orange are areas that have permafrost today, but that permafrost will be gone by 2100. And then the areas in yellow, this lighter yellow, are areas that will still have permafrost by 2100. But look at all the orange and wet, red that we have predicted that we're going to lose all of that permafrost because of global warming. We're going to see a little bit later on that actually the fastest area on Earth as far as a warming trend, you might expect the equator. It's actually not. It's the Arctic Ocean, guys, is where we're seeing some of the greatest changes in temperature. So it makes sense we're losing a lot of permafrost in our Arctic biome. Now let's go south to our Antarctic biome. This occurs, as the name suggests, on the continent of Antarctica, but also on what are called sub-Antarctic islands. There are actually two island chains right here. By the way, this is the very southern uh, tip of South America here, guys. These island chains over here are called the South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands. Those also support Antarctic tundra. Now, this is colder and drier <coughs> than the Arctic tundra. So while all tundra is cold and dry, this is a little bit harsher than the Arctic tundra. And so 
most of it is actually ice and rock. It's too cold, too harsh to support life. Now, I'm not saying it's completely devoid of life. There are pockets of life that exist in Antarctica, but if you were, say, to pick the one biome with the lowest biodiversity of any of the others, it would be the Antarctic tundra. Okay, It's harsher than our Arctic and Alpine tundra regions. It's colder and drier. And so you won't see those large mammals like Arctic foxes, polar bears, or even reindeer, at least in Antarctica. Our last tundra is our Alpine tundra. These are located in mountain chains that at least have an elevation of 10,000 feet. So that's the bare minimum of elevation. They're found at 10,000 feet above sea level or higher. So Rocky Mountains, yes, we will find alpine tundra in the Rocky Mountains. In the Appalachians, no, because the Appalachians aren't 10,000 feet tall. Now, the reason why it's so cold is because of the lower air pressure. Lower air pressure leads to a decrease in kinetic energy, which leads to a decrease in temperature. Remember, we talked about temperature is the description of the average kinetic energy of molecules in a substance. Now, the Arctic tundra has permafrost. The Antarctic tundra has permafrost. But the Alpine tundra does not. It doesn't get as cold and therefore lacks that permanently frozen soil and so is much better drained and you'll see a much wider variety of plant life that lives in the alpine tundra compared to the other two. All right, let's move on to deserts. A desert is a biome that is uh, classified based on the amount of precipitation not temperature, ladies and gentlemen. So if you're an area that receives, is, receives less than 10 inches a year, then you're classified as a desert. Now, there are two major natural causes of deserts. Atmospheric circulation patterns and something called the rain shadow effect. And we're going to talk about each of these uh, here in a second. Now, once again, deserts are not classified based on temperature. While most of us, this is what we think of when we hear the word desert, this is also a desert. We can get what is called a polar desert. As long as you receive less than 10 inches of precipitation a year, then you're classified as a desert. All right, let's talk about these natural causes. The first one is due to atmospheric circulation patterns. Remember when we were talking about our Earth cycles, I said that there was both a horizontal component of motion to the atmosphere, things that we call winds, and there's a vertical component. This vertical component are what are known as circulation cells. Now we have two cells located between zero, that's the equator, and 30 degrees south and 30 degrees north latitude. These circulation cells are what are known as Hadley cells. And here's what goes on. So right here at the equator, guys, we have warm air. Because remember we talked about maximum insulation, minimum albedo. So we warm air here at the equator. It rises. As it begins to rise, it has all that moisture in it, which falls out in precipitation, which is why the equator is very, very wet. As that air continues to rise, it loses all of its moisture. It moves into the upper parts of the atmosphere. Where it cools down, it sinks back down to the Earth's surface because it's more dense. As it sinks, it has very little moisture left. So what we see are some of the major deserts lie at 30 degrees south latitude and 30 degrees north latitude. These Hadley cells are driven by convection. You remember that word, guys. Hot air rises, cold air sinks because of density differences. 
so that hot air as it rises it dumps all of its moisture but as this colder air comes back to to earth it has very little moisture left so one of these Hadley cells operates in the southern hemisphere one of these Hadley cells operates in the northern hemisphere so because of that those two latitude lines 30 north and 30 south that's where we have major deserts the other process that creates natural deserts is something called the rain shadow effect and I want you to picture the west coast of, of North America here so what we have is a lot of evaporation that goes on from the Pacific Ocean so all of that moisture uh, creates clouds the clouds move on shore but they're weighted down they have all that moisture in them so they're fat they're heavy they hit this barrier the Sierra Nevadas or, or even the Rocky Mountains depending on where you are and they can't go anywhere they dump all of their moisture on one side they rise because they've lost all that weight they travel over the mountains but by the time they get over here on this side they have very little moisture left so on one side of the mountains what is called the leeward side you'll get very wet conditions think of Seattle think of Oregon Washington Northern California and on the other side you'll get the Mojave guys we are part of the Mojave Desert here in southern Nevada the Mojave Desert is a rain shadow desert um, here are your major deserts so if you look at the world's biggest desert is the Sahara which falls look at it right on this 30 degrees north latitude you also see the Middle East guys which is a fairly sizable desert also falls on that 30 degrees north so that's those Hadley cells the other big one is called the Great Western or Great Sandy or Great Victorian Desert found in Western Australia this falls right along uh, 30 degrees south latitude so these three deserts are all created by those Hadley cells these other ones the Gobi Desert here the Mojave Desert here even the Patagonian Desert in South America these are all rain shadow deserts you have a coastline you have a mountain range and on the other side you have these major deserts our next biome is the savanna now this biome is sandwiched between our tropical rainforests and our desert biomes if you look at Africa here guys here is the Sahara a desert here is the tropical rainforest and so savannas are often known as tropical grasslands they have characteristics of of grasslands but with more precipitation now if you take a look at the picture down below guys uh, instead of normal grasslands we actually will see scattered trees you won't see really thick forests but you'll get vegetation you'll get enough precipitation your soil will be a little bit thicker a little bit better developed you will get tree formation but m the main vegetation is going to be grasses and flowering plants um, generally this is a biome also where you'll see two seasons you'll get a a dry winter season and a wet monsoonal summer season where you'll get most of your precipitation for the year uh, if we talk about animals here uh, as you can see uh, those are antelope that you see in the picture but this is where you would find elephants and giraffes and and tigers and cheetahs and a whole host of other organisms if you've ever been on a savanna or I'm sorry on a, sa a safari generally this is where you they take you is to the African savanna our last terrestrial biome are our wetlands these are areas where the soil is either seasonally or permanently saturated with water now if your soil is completely saturated this will create standing water at the earth's surface now there's different types of wetlands described by their vegetation our swamps are our forested wetlands okay if we were to say take a look at the US where would we find swamps well Florida Texas Alabama 
uh, all along our Gulf Coast states. In fact, the, probably the most well-known swamp is the Everglades, guys, in Florida. That would be a wetland or more specifically a swamp. Our marshes, these are wetlands without trees. These would be found in higher latitudes. So if you've ever heard that Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes, this is where marshes are fairly common. So northern Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, these are where we would find marshes. And lastly, we have bogs. Bogs are characterized by something called peat. We haven't talked about peat. We'll get to this when we get to energy. But peat is undecayed plant material. So all that green that you see at the surface there in that bottom lower right picture is partially decayed plant material. Um, bogs generally are found even in higher latitudes. You might find a bog sandwiched in either a boreal forest or even a tundra region. So these are going to be found closer to our polar areas. All right, let's move on to our coastal biomes. And before we talk about them, let's talk about what a coast is. Uh, it is the area that extends inland away from the water's edge, so away from the ocean, that is heavily influenced by the action of waves. We'll talk about what a wave is here in a second. Now, when it comes to coastal environments, there's two main types. Something that we call active coasts, if you take a look at the lower right-hand picture there, these are coastlines that are located either at or near a plate boundary. Think of the west coast of North America, guys. We have a plate boundary there, don't we? We have the San Andreas in the southern regions, and we have the subduction zone of the Juan de Fuca in the northern regions. So active coasts, if you take a look at the picture, these are generally characterized by um, steeply sloping vertical cliffs where we tend to see rocks, no beaches. It's, it's a high energy environment. And so it, you, just, you just don't get the formation of beaches. The passive coasts, these are coastlines that are nowhere near a plate boundary. Think of the East Coast, guys, uh, along um, Florida, South Carolina, um, all of those where you get the development of these nice, well-defined beaches because it's a low energy environment. So active coast, high energy environment, no beaches. Passive coast, low energy environments. These are where you tend to get your nice, sandy uh, beaches where people tend to congregate. Now let's talk a little bit about what waves are. A wave is an undulation on the ocean surface generated by winds. Remember we talked about how surface oceanic currents were generated by the friction of the wind blowing across the ocean surface. The size of any wave is going to be affected by three factors. Wind velocity, the length of time the wind blows, and something called the fetch, which is the distance over which the wind blows. If you maximize all three, you have a high wind velocity, a long period of time that the wind blows, and a large fetch, you tend to get big waves. If you minimize those three, you'll get smaller waves. Now, we also need to talk about something called tides. Tides are the periodic raising and lowering of sea level that occurs on a daily basis. And it is driven by a combination of both motion and gravitational effects between the Earth, Moon, and the Sun. Most people think it's only caused by gravity. That's not true. The motion of the Moon and the Earth as they orbit around each, uh, each other and as, they, as the Earth orbits around the Sun that also affects tides as well. Now, you'll notice these pictures here, guys. 
when they're all aligned, as you see in this lower left-hand picture, the gravitational and motion effects add up. And so this is where you'll get what are called high tides. So you'll get this, these additive effects where you'll get large high tides. Now when they're not in phase, when the moon is out of phase, notice that you'll get smaller tides because the, um, the gravitational and motion effects actually subtract from each other. So when they're all aligned, you're going to get really, really, really high tides. When they're not aligned, this is when you're going to get low tides. So it's all having to do with the alignment, whether you're adding the motion and gravitational forces or you're subtracting because they're out of alignment. Now this takes us to our first coastal biome, which is the intertidal zone. This is the area, the coastal area, that is influenced by the action of tides. Now, generally we will see high biodiversity here because you have abundant light, abundant oxygen, and high nutrients. Those are three great things to suggest that organisms will tend to, to thrive here. Now, we have three different zones. This zone right here is this what is labeled here as A is called the low intertidal zone. This is only exposed to air at very, very low tides. So the majority of the time, you are going to see animals that are um, adapted to an oceanic environment but can survive being exposed to air for short periods of time. We have the mid-intertidal zone. These, this is an area that is kind of 50-50. It's half exposed to air, and it's um, half exposed underwater. Um, actually, I made a mistake here, ladies and gentlemen. Here is the low intertidal zone, is this B. Here is this mid-intertidal zone, labeled as A, and then lastly, we have D. This is the high intertidal zone that is only going to be covered at very, very high tides. So most of animals living there are going to be adapted to a being exposed to air, but they can tolerate being exposed to water for short periods of time. And so if you take a look at these three zones, B, A, and D here, you're going to have different collection of organisms. Organisms that you'd find down here in the low intertidal zone are not going to be found in the, in the mid or the high levels. And what you find here in the mid intertidal zone is going to just be found there. So each of these collections of organisms are going to be completely different from one another because conditions are different from one another. Here are some of these tidal pools. What generally happens in areas where, where, when the tide goes out, um, animals will flock to these pools, and so they'll survive underwater until the tides come back in, and then they can freely move about. Our next coastal biome is chaparral. This is the smallest biome of any you can see a little parts of uh, southern Australia, a little bit of northern Africa and southern parts along the Mediterranean Sea, probably best known in California. It's, it's very common in central and south southern California. Um, this, is, this biome is actually created when cool seawater, and the Pacific is a lot colder than the Atlantic, guys, meets a landmass with high temperatures. So California, fairly hot in both summer and winter months, and so you get a warm landmass that meets a cooler oceanic water body. Now, in this biome, you'll get very, very mild winters. Think of, of San Diego, guys, in December, fairly mild. But the summers are very, very hot and dry. You tend to get low precipitation. 
And so once again, vegetation here uh, is going to have adapted to this fairly um, dry environment, especially during the summer months. Our last coastal biome are our estuaries. An estuary is where you have a freshwater stream that flows into a salt water oceanic body. And what you have is you have a mixing zone. You actually get what is called brackish conditions, where you mix salt water with fresh water. So what you have is the water is no longer fresh, but it doesn't have as high a salt content as oceanic water. It's somewhere in between. That's what we call brackish water. And so we actually have a lot of life that has adapted. They need some of that salt content, but they don't want it as high as it is in ocean water. And so they tend to thrive in these brackish estuary biomes. One of the largest estuaries is the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. Um, what you see is an air, uh, a photo from uh, taken from space on the left. Here is uh, something, uh, a uh, schematic showing salinity. These numbers are actually salinity levels. And so um, you'll actually see as you go upstream, you'll see these salinity levels decrease. And so you'll actually see a change as you go into these areas. You'll see a changing of plant and animal species as the salinity numbers change. All right, our last major biomes are our marine biomes. And we only have the two, shallow marine and deep marine. Now, these are tied to the geologic features offshore. Our shallow marine biomes are going to be found on something right here called the continental shelf. This is a fairly shallow, flat area located just off our continental landmass. This is where we're going to find our shallow marine biomes. Now you'll notice that we have um, a very steeply sloping, um, what is called the, the shelf break here, that leads us, uh, actually this is the continental slope here guys, that leads us to something called the abyssal plain. These are the deep um, oceanic parts of the basin where we might be talking about three or four miles um, of water on top. These are where our deep marine biomes are going to be found. So they're linked to this, these uh, geologic features. On the continental shelf is where we're going to find the shallow marine. And then once you get past this continental slope here into the deeper portions, portions this is where we're going to find our deep marine biomes. So let's talk. Uh, and here are our continental shelves. Everywhere you see the gray areas, guys, so you'll notice that, that our continental shelves are actually well developed on our passive coastlines. Remember we talked about active is where you have plate boundaries, passive is where you don't. So generally where you have passive coastal areas is where you'll have these nice well-developed shelves and which is where you'll see those shallow marine biomes. Now, we really have two shallow marine biomes. Um, we're going to have our coral reefs, which is the top picture, and our seagrass beds, which is the bottom picture. Now, just like on land, remember we talked earlier on about our uh, ecological pyramid. And so, just like in land, guys, in the oceans, the most important group are the ones that make their own food. Remember we talked about through photosynthesis. So algae and phytoplankton. Plankton are small microscopic organisms. We call them phytoplankton because they perform, perform photosynthesis. Those are the most important group in our shallow marine biomes. Now you'll notice in both pictures guys sunlight can reach both coral reefs and the seagrass beds and that's how we can have photosynthetic organisms. Now coral reefs have a fairly high biodiversity guys from from corals to fish to turtles to sharks uh, to sponges all different fairly high biodiversity. 
Uh, here are pictures of, of coral reef. This is the largest coral reef on world on Earth. This is the uh, the uh, the reef off of Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, one of the largest reefs um, on Earth. And then finally, our deep marine biomes. This is by far the larger of the two marine biomes. About 75% of all our ocean basins are, are on that abyssal plain, that very, very, very deep uh, parts of the ocean, where you're talking about the average depth uh, to, the, to the sea level floor is about two miles. Now, in these environments, you're gonna have very, very low temperatures, very, very low pressures, and absolutely no sunlight. And so these organisms that live in this particular biome, and there's not a lot, guys. Biodiversity is going to be fairly low here. But some of these organisms have uh, evolved something called bioluminescence, which is they actually produce an enzyme within their cells that glows. You probably know bioluminescence uh, when you were younger and chased fireflies during the summer months, guys. Fireflies pr bioluminesce. They produce that enzyme that makes their, their tails or their rear um, abdominal areas glow. Well, in this case, we uh, might be talking about, this is a picture of a jellyfish, a squid, and this is called a dragonfish. All have evolved this bioluminescence because it's so, so very dark you're talking about two miles to see to the sea bottom you're not going to see any any sunlight at all so very very cold very very dark very very high pressure areas which means your biodiversity is going to be fairly low that is the end of this topic ladies and gentlemen